Good morning. How's everybody doing? Let me do a little bit of a self-introduction. I am David Kane. I am the Director of Finance for the City of Fountain Valley. Been here for about a year and a half. I have uh, 23 years of public sector experience having worked in the cities of Sierra Madre, uh, Chino, uh, worked for Moulton Niguel Water District uh, down in South County here. And then prior to coming to Fountain Valley, I also spent 18 months working in the city of San Bernardino. Yes, the one that's bankrupt. So <laughs> trying to help them go through their challenges, um, came on board after they had filed bankruptcy, looked at some of the challenges that they were dealing with, and again, bringing that expertise to this organization. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of Fountain Valley. So. One of the things I want to look at is how many of you have ever been whitewater rafting? A lot of you, okay. So you enjoy that thrill, right? And as you're, as you're riding down that rapid, what you're looking at is you don't know what's around the corner yet, do you? You know, and so one of the things that we're going to be looking at, and I kind of want to use this analogy as, as we move forward is you know, the last 40 years that we've had a relationship with the state of California and local agencies, it's been like going on a whitewater rafting ride. I've never had the opportunity to actually be out on the water, but one of the things that I enjoyed doing, especially when I was in high school and college, was backpacking, taking high school and college kids in for a week into the high Sierras and having the opportunity to walk along those types of rivers, really enjoying the sound and and the um, ambiance of being in that particular area. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're going to be looking at today is explaining where does the money come from and then spending a little bit of time of looking at where does the money go in public sector. But before we do that, one of the things that we all need to understand is how did we get here? So we're going to look at and spend a few minutes talking about that fiscal relationship between the state of California and us. So we're going to go on a ride. You guys ready to go? Yeah. Okay. I'm ready. I have my life jacket because I know what to expect because I've been on this ride already. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to be able to do that. Now, I do have some unfortunate news. The cushion seat underneath you is not a flotation device. <laughs> so we'll try and figure out how to make that work for you. But you guys ready to go? Yeah, ready. OK. So this is the chart. I've provided a chart for you. And we're going to take a ride around this particular um, map in terms of the river. And we're going to make some stops along the way. So the first stop I'm going to take is let me just simplify it for you. Here it is. OK? This is Finance 101. So you notice that there are blue lines, there are red lines, there are green lines. There is money moving from here to there. The takeaway on this is it's gotten really complicated over the last 40 years. So the challenge that we have is the way that we used to be able to manage local government back in the 60s and the 70s has changed a lot. So let's head down the river and look at 1961. Now, I'm doing a nice headstand there. There's my sister and my mom, because we moved to Orange County in 1961. But my parents bought their first house in North Orange County, and we had the opportunity to begin to look at, hey, property tax in California it's getting really expensive. So what happened in that process is somebody by the name of who? Howard Jarvis came along. All right? So now we're looking at 1978 and putting a proposition on the ballot. Now I kind of think back to my history and say, hey, what was I doing in 1978? Buying my first house. Realizing, hey, I'm going to benefit from Prop 13 
And we were really excited at that time, by the way, because not only were we going to get into the first house that we were going to buy, but I was getting a phenomenal, great interest rate of 10%. <laughs> and then it went to 11, 12, and 13. So we were happy with 10. So most of us these days have an interest rate that's a lot lower than that, but we not only had a high interest rate, but we had high property tax. So Prop 13 was put on the ballot, and as you can see here, almost 63% of you said, great idea, right? And so it was implemented. What happened was, basically it rolled back the property values a couple of years. It put a 1% limit in terms of the assessed value. So once we knew what that new assessed value was, your property tax could not exceed that 1%. Second thing is, it only allowed a maximum of a 2% a year increase on your assessed value. And finally, it only changed the reassessed value when you sold your home. So otherwise, if you're in a pre-78 home, you're going to be paying at a much, much lower rate. So my parents still own their home in La Habra and they're paying pre-Prop 13 money. So what did that mean for local agencies? Well, what it meant was the reality is that the way property tax is going to be separated is now controlled by the state of California, not locally. Because prior to this time, we had something called the mill rate, and we can make local property tax adjustments. That completely went away in Prop 13. So when you look at Prop 13, here's what happened to local agencies. 60% reduction. So what happened in many organizations is we reduced the number of staff. So we had to adjust to that because the amount of revenue that was coming in decreased substantially. Now, the other thing that happened is it changed the way schools got funded. So now all of a sudden the schools were using that same mill rate concept and now they've got the same cap in terms of their revenue stream. So back forward a little bit and look at 1988-89 and all of us were saying, hey, wait a minute, education's important. The children, look at the words up there we take care of our children, then that solves a lot of our problems. So we put on the ballot Proposition 98 and said, it's for the kids. Now, what did that do? What was the dynamics of that? Well, guess what? It gave money to schools from the state general fund. So for every dollar that had been going into the state general fund, 45 cents of that was now required to go to education. So sales tax, property tax, income tax, all was now 45 cents. So that discretionary fund that the state had was no longer discretionary. So what happened? <laughs> Whitewater rescue, right? We need some help here. Somebody need a life vest? Here you go, sir. Uh, good luck. All right? So what happened for us is something called ERAFT. Education Revenue Augmentation Fund. And what it did, bottom line, in 1992 is the state of California came along and said, we can't balance our budget, so we're going to go and we're going to put our hand into local agency coffers and we're going to take money from them. And that was the equivalent of 24%. So in 1992, the state of California came into Fountain Valley and started pulling what was property tax revenue for us away. What does that mean? Well. That freed up money in the general fund because now they were meeting the Prop 98 obligation. 
So the state balanced its budget. The local agencies were back at square one again saying, hey, wait a minute, $2.8 million that we contribute on an ongoing basis to ERAFT today. You thought the sand around the corner was a curve. It's not. It's another waterfall. And what does that waterfall represent? Oh, the state had come up with great ideas. We like ERAFT 1. Let's think about ERAFT 2 and 3. So what they did is over a two-year period, they came to cities throughout California after we had adopted our budget and said, by the way, we're sorry. Let me back up a minute. Why am I saying after the fact? State and local agencies, for the most part, are in the same fiscal year, July to June. We have to have a balanced budget adopted by the end of June for the new fiscal year. Well, the state of California had gotten historically in a place where they weren't adopting their budget in June or July or August <laughs> or September. And one year it was October. And what they told us in October is, oh, well, we can't balance our budget, but we've now figured out a way. And we're not going to take permanent money away from you. We're going to take one-time money. So please write us a check, $1.4 million. We had to cop up the cash. So that happened. And then 9-10 came along. They go, well, you know, we've been kind of digging, digging the general fund. We'll go after redevelopment money. And we thought we had fixed this with some legislation that the League of California Cities and us had put together to try and stop that bleeding from happening from the state of California. But they came along and took $3.4 million in terms of our redevelopment money. Now we're done, right? Oh, no. Not yet. Well, we're not doing a permanent take. We're not doing a one-time take. We're just going to borrow it for three years. <coughs> and then we're going to pay it back. So in 9-10, they borrowed $1.2 million to be paid back in three years, which they did do. So what was the impact to Fountain Valley? $41.5 million that we have given up in property tax monies that are post Prop 13 that we were supposed to be getting until the current fiscal year. And in addition to that, about 2.8 million, as I indicated earlier, is still being taken away from us. Now, one of the reasons why having money in the bank is so important is because of those kinds of events that have gone on. So this city has done a really great job of putting together policies and procedures in terms of reserves. And so this chart represents the types of reserves that we've put together. So as you look at it, budget stabilization happens to be one of them. Well, why do you think we did it? Think of ERAFT 1, 2, 3, borrowing. We never know what the state's going to do. It's out of our control. So we're putting money aside for that purpose. If we had a natural disaster of any magnitude, that million dollars would be a drop in the bucket. One of the challenges we have with any natural disaster is the event happens. We spend the money. Yes, there's something called FEMA. There's something that's called OES, where we eventually get money back. But that may take two or three years. I was up in Sierra Madre at the time that we had the fires up there. And it took about three years to get that money back for the cost of fighting those wildfires. Economic development activity. I'll talk in a minute about the dissolution of the redevelopment agency. And we really don't have as much of a tool available for us anymore. Working cash. I'll show you in a minute because we get a large chunk of our money two times a year. We need to have working cash sitting in there. So those reserves are extremely, extremely important. So let's take a look at that Prop 13 dollar. 
So when you write a check to Orange County to pay your property tax, one of the sheets that's included in there is this particular sheet. So you will notice that when you write a check to Orange County, Fountain Valley gets how much? Less than 13 cents. Okay? That ERAFT fund sitting up there, by the way, gets more than we do. That was money that prior to ERAFT got split amongst all of those agencies out there. So when you look at the amount of, of, of that dollar that's going to schools, that's part of the way the Prop 13 money was split. Now, how do we compare to surrounding communities? One of the things that happened in Prop 13 is every community was treated differently because there were different things going on. So you'll notice looking at this chart, we kind of sit in the middle, but you'll see that Irvine, who was incorporated after 78, gets very little, less than three cents. And you've got somebody like Laguna Beach who gets a lot more. So even city side by side, there's no ability to equally be compare them. All right. Doing your job saving, everybody? <laughs> He's got his life jacket. He's ready to go. So let's look at Prop 13 specifically. So what I did is went back in, and you can go in and pull up your property tax bill. You can go into the Orange County website. And so I did that. I went in on a street in Fountain Valley, pulled up two houses on the same street, and <clears throat> look at and compared those. Now, what this chart tells you is that about 3,100 homes are pre-Prop 13 homes still in Fountain Valley today. About 1,500, almost 15,6, about 80% are post-Prop 13. So they've been reassessed when they've been sold. All right? And what you'll see is those pre-Prop 13 monies that come in on those 3,000 homes is less than $700,000 a year. For the balance of those, 7.2 is what's coming in in property tax dollars. So this is a house, happens to be on Poppy. Pre-Prop 13 was sold in 1967. You'll see the assessed value here is fairly low. And so they pay $647 a year in Prop 13 money. Fountain Valley gets $83, okay, for all the services that we provide. Now, go down the street. Here's another home, and it happens to have been sold in 2007. It's paying about $6,500 in total property taxes. About 5,700 of that's Prop 13, and they're contributing $736 to the city of Fountain Valley. So how does that break out? By the way, when you look at your property tax bill, you'll see other charges on there. Typically, those that are above that break are voter-approved bonds that have been sold, a lot of times for schools, that type of thing, that you have approved. It's part of your property tax bill. So here's how that $83 breaks out, okay? So when you look at it, you can see the schools are getting the majority of the money. Fountain Valley Elementary, Huntington Beach, ERAFT is again going to the schools. Fountain Valley is getting that $83. Now I looked at it a different way. I said, okay, let's take that $83 and break it out. So when you call the fire department or the police department, that home, and a typical home in, in Fountain Valley has about three individuals living in that home, they contribute $32 a year. So if you have a medical call, you think $32 covers the cost of staff to respond to that medical call. No, nope, don't think so. So you can see how it breaks down and how we have a challenge in terms of where those dollars go. Now, one of the things I did, and somebody says, well, that's, that's the extreme. That's the low part. Okay, well, let's take the mean. What's the mean? 
That means 50% is more than that, 50% is less than that. So take that $513, break it out. Same type of thing. You can see the majority of it, again, going to education because that's how Prop 13 worked. So the city is getting $513. So now we're a little bit better shape. Police Department is getting $198. And again, you can see how it's being broken down by the various types of services out there. The other thing it did is it changed the way that we looked at our land. We used the term fiscalization of land use. Well, if I can't get a lot of value property tax-wise, maybe I can get it sales tax-wise. So organizations look at, you know, in many cases, in our case, it's the second largest revenue stream is sales tax. So bringing in that Sam's Club, bringing in that Costco into the community means a huge revenue stream for a city. An average Costco brings in about a million dollars a year. So that sales tax is 8% in Orange County. The city of Fountain Valley gets 1% of that. So again, the rest of that pie is split up between the state and county realignment, that type of thing. We also have in this county Measure M, which is a quarter percent sales tax, which goes for transportation. We do benefit from that. And then somebody will say, well, Proposition 172 was put in after, after Prop 13, and that was for public safety. And I go, absolutely. And we put it for public safety. Represents $400,000 a year here. So it's not a huge amount of money. So how do we go about balancing a budget out there, even when we look at sales tax. Sales tax is driven by where that location is. It's got to be physically in Fountain Valley. Go outside of Fountain Valley, that 1% sales tax is going to go to that community, not to our community. We don't have automobile dealerships, so we're not benefiting from that. We do have RV, but nothing in terms of um, automobile. Now, we've got the internet come up into the current times, and we've got a huge amount of internet sales. A lot of that is not transaction-based in terms of its locale, because Amazon made a special deal with the state of California. They said, we will collect the use tax on your behalf, and we will put distribution centers throughout California. So right now they have five distribution centers. Moreno Valley, Pleasanton, San Bernardino, a couple of other locations out there. You say, well, great, those communities win. No, they don't, because it doesn't go to those communities, it goes into the pool. So in the pool, we get about 1.8% of the county pool. So those sales get distributed amongst the counties, then get distributed into the cities. Now, Internet sales for us these days, about $300,000 a year. So it is a revenue stream, but it's not significant enough, again, to be able to balance the budget. We do have a sales tax sharing agreement. They're currently sitting as one of the two parcels that's sitting out there, uh, a prior uh, city yard uh, property. They lease that from us, so we get just under $500,000 for that. And then for every dollar they generate, we get 50 cents of that. So we do benefit from the fact that we have a sales tax sharing agreement, so we get about $850,000 a year, again, going into the general fund. So where are we now? You guys feeling good on this ride so far? <laughs> Some of you we've lost. <laughs> you've fallen in, you're swimming, the shore's right there. But as we move forward and look at well, where's that revenue come from? <coughs> I've described some of it, but what you'll see here is this is all revenue citywide. So the reason I have a box around the general fund is that's the only one that's discretionary. All of the others are restricted in nature. So I can't take enterprise money, which is water, sewer, solid waste, and hire a policeman. Can't do. I can't use special revenue for hiring a fireman. 
We'd be able to use general fund money to it, and that's why we term it the flexible fund. So let's look at the general fund in a little bit more detail. So here's the major revenue sources we get into the general fund. You can see property tax is the largest piece of the pie. The next one is sales tax, and then franchise fees. Here's where I wanted to digress for a minute and say, why do I need eight to nine million dollars worth of working cash flow to be able to have sitting in the bank? Well, how often do you guys pay your property tax bill? Every month, right? Oh, twice a year. Twice a year. So when do we get paid? Twice a year. So that means that that $16.6 .6 million, we get $8 million of it in late December, January. We get another $8 million of it in June, July. So what happens in the meantime? So as you may recall, when I did the mid-year report to City Council, I said, by the way, if you look at July to December, we have about $8 million more in expenditures than we have in revenue. That's because I haven't got property tax yet. So having that cash in the bank is extremely important. If I didn't have it in the bank, I couldn't pay the bills. And for some reason, staff expects a regular paycheck. <laughs> you, know? you guys expect a regular paycheck living in the community. You don't want to be working for an employer that goes, well, you know, our money's kind of up and down, and so we'll, we'll pay you when we have it. No, not quite. So we've got to figure out how to deal with that cash flow. So again, that's part of the importance of the reserves. So at 8.7 that we've got set aside, that's the reason why. So again, as we continue to move down, where do we spend our money? Where does that money go to? So if I look at Fountain Valley, and again, I look at high level, 30,000 feet, this is all of the expenditures. So you'll see general fund, again, being the largest portion of that, but water money can only be spent on water. Can't be spent somewhere else. Measure M money can only be spent on road improvements. They can't be spent on hiring public safety individuals. So let's look at the general fund. This is kind of a picture of typical city sitting out there um, in a typical city. And, you know, we kind of fit into that somewhat, although you'll notice as you read down the list of the type of revenues in there, they happen to have utility users tax. We don't have that. But we do have the property tax, the sales tax. We do have our own fire, our own police. Uh, library happens to be with the county. So how does that break down dollar-wise? So what I did is I put this chart together and I said, well, let's take all of the property tax and what's that going to get us? Well, it'll get us police services and a little bit of fire. So what people need to recognize in the community is when you pay your property tax bill and you say, hey, I paid for public safety, mm, kind of. You paid for part of it, not all of it. So I've got sales tax sitting in there that needs to make up some of that. Then I add functional revenue in there, user fees. One of the things that's important for us is when we're providing services out there, and it's unique in terms of the level of service, plan check, those types of things, we have that user pay a fee for it so it doesn't come out of general revenue. But you can see I can now add public works in there. I can throw the franchise fees in there. Hey, now I've covered recreation, okay? And so on as you go down through the list. Now what you will notice when you get to the bottom and you add them up, what you're gonna find is something that we call structural deficit. That means that our operating revenue is not enough to cover our operating expenses. And you say, well, why? What have you done? What are the types of things that you've done to to address that. Well, let me back up for a minute and talk about the whole state issue. This is the question that was asked one time when I was making this presentation is, well, did you guys just sit back and take it? No, we didn't. Worked closely with the League of California Cities 
and we passed something in, in 2004 that said, leave sales tax and property tax alone. State came along, and as you may recall, and borrowed RDA money. We said, well, we thought that was protected. Well, no, you didn't quite write the language good enough, and so you need to go back. And so we went back again in 2006 and tightened up the language on redevelopment money. So we worked again with the league and all of the cities throughout California to make that work. Then the state came along and figured out some other loopholes in there. And so in 2010, we did Proposition 22 to try and protect that. And we thought we were in good shape. It now protected RDAs. Minor detail. The state spends their time thinking about how do I get around that? So here's how they got around it. They said, well, we're not going to take the money. We're just going to make you dissolve them. So redevelopment agencies go away. OK, now what am I going to do? So in 2012, they got rid of redevelopment agencies. And the challenge that we had in Fountain Valley is because we had money sitting there that we hadn't yet used for important economic development projects, which we had on the plans. They said, write us a check. So we literally had to write a check for $47.6 million to the state of California and give our redevelopment money back to the state. Money that we had collected over time that was going to be used here locally. Then they came along and said, well, you know those obligations and those agreements that you had? And King's X on a couple of those also. So they came along and said, well, we don't think that sales tax sharing agreement was really a redevelopment agency obligation. And oh, by the way, those bonds that you sold to build the community center, OK? Um, we don't think they're redevelopment. So they're now general fund obligations. So the bottom line was $1.2 million problem. So as we came into last year's budget, we had a $1.2 million problem. Part of the way that we solved that, and this is not a permanent solution, is we had $738,000 in one time, what we call triple flip money. Which, by the way, I haven't even talked this morning about triple flip or VLF and Lou, and I'm not going to. But those, again, were things that the state did that impacted us locally. So in that triple flip true up, we were owed money from 10 years ago when they first implemented that and took a quarter percent of our sales tax and then ran around buttoned it to get it back to us. So that $1.2 million shrunk to just under $300,000. So this is kind of that chart again, looking at, and, and what this does is identify the types of things that communities have done to try and address the issues that we've got out there, uh, and what the state has done to counteract all of those. So where are we at today? Well, that's the history. So how do we move forward as an organization and as a community is realizing that we need to solve, to the best of our ability, the long-term issues. We can solve short-term, OK? We looked at last year and say, OK, well, 300000 we you've got money in the bank, we'll, we'll solve it. Well, part of our obligation and part of the thing that I'm committed to as a finance director is to leave an organization in the best shape that I can possibly leave them today, tomorrow, and into the future. City managers got that same commitment of being able to say, what can we do in the long run to make us fiscally sustainable? So let's kind of look at the trip log. You guys have been down the, the rapids. Some of you made it because you had a life vest. Others of you weren't so fortunate. But remember, we had to deal with 60% takeaway. We had to deal with ERAP takeaway, and we're dealing with it today. Redevelopment, eight million gone on an ongoing basis. That was going to be money that was going to be coming to the city. So you look at that and say, hey, economic 
opportunities have now gone away because that money is being taken away from us. And then the dissolution has got us into the situation where we have a $1.2 million obligation on a go forward basis. So we're right now in the process of developing the 1617 budget. We've just met with all of the operating departments and we're having a discussion about how you solve the structural deficit. How do you deal with that? One of the things that, as, as we're aware, we did a community survey and out there one of the things that we found, A, was that the community was happy with public services that they were getting, from, especially for public safety. There was a desire to maintain our community and one of the challenges that we're going to have with a structural deficit is how do you go about maintaining that. Also going to be looking at updating a 10-year model that we put together. Um, we update it every single year. If you look at that model at this moment in time, it goes from about 30 million in cash down to about 8 million in 10 years. So how do we deal with that? Also, we're developing a fiscal sustainability plan. So those are some of the challenges we're looking at, some of the things that we're trying to do in terms of moving the organization forward. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of a gift of the adventure. Uh, you can see what the challenge is. I think sometimes what I hear is, well, it's the same story over and over and over and over. Yes, it is, but it's a story that we don't control. So understanding what that story is is extremely important as we move forward as an organization to try and solve the challenges um, going forward. Um, again, I appreciate everybody coming out. Appreciate uh, your time. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. Has it been? Yes. Okay. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to share this information. If you have any questions, I am available uh, at any point in time to answer them. So again, thank you very much.